But we're pumped up, man. Today, we are starting off a brand new series just simply called Kingdom of God. And as I was writing out this message to preach today, I realized, man, this isn't just one message. This is really two messages. And so we're gonna do a two-part mini-series, really. We could do a 10-part series on the kingdom of God, but it's just gonna be two weeks where we just kind of unpack what does it mean to be a part of the kingdom of God. And I got a theme verse. I love a good theme verse for a series. And our theme verse this series is Matthew 6, 33. And I don't know about you, man, but... There has been a revival in my life on God's word. Um, it's always been a part of my life, but I have realized, man, I need God's word more than ever, and I have been reading God's word more than ever, and I'm just fired up about God's word. Can I get a good amen? And at Rise Church, we stand to honor the reading of God's word, and I don't know if you like this, but I just think there is something to it. I think that God, again, looks down and goes, Man, they're gonna stand up when they read my word. I like that. So here we go together. Come on, Matthew 6, 33. Let's read it together. One, two, three, here we go. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Come on, take a seat. This is the words of Jesus. And Jesus is preaching probably, probably his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, and he is just dropping truth bomb after truth bomb. And he gets to Matthew 6, and he says this. Hey, there's a lot of things that you can seek in your life. But there is one thing that's more important than all those other things. It's his kingdom and his righteousness. And matter of fact, if you get this right and you seek him first, all the other things in your life will work themselves out. Like God will provide, he'll take care of everything else. So just seek him. It doesn't mean life's easy. It means that he's good and he is your father who will take care of you. How many of you love making lists? Man, I love making a good list. I don't care if it's the grocery store, man. I'm gonna, I get out the paper, I get the flyer or I go online. I see what the ad is. I circle it with my marker and then I make my list. Sometimes I do it on paper. Sometimes I do it in my phone. I love making lists. I like making lists of things I need to do around the house. My wife really loves to make lists of things that she wants me to do around the house. I love making lists. If I had a list of all the things that I enjoy, list would be at the top of my list. I like making lists because I love checking things off my list when I get them done. And I wanna ask you this question. If you had a list of things that you enjoy in your life, would seeking God be on it? Would it be at the top? And I think as followers of Jesus, we would all proclaim, yes, God, in my life, I wanna seek you. But if we're not careful, we might find ourselves in a place in different seasons from time to time where maybe we, just maybe, we're seeking a lot of other things and we're still seeking God, we're just not seeking him first. Or we're seeking other things and maybe God's on the back burner and we're not necessarily seeking him like we were just a few months ago. And what I wanna talk about today is this, that God's kingdom needs to be established in our lives and it needs to come first. And so today I wanna preach around this idea that God is king. Come on, can I get a good amen? amen. Ooh, that was a bad amen. I said, God is king. Amen. There we go, there we go. And he invites us to be a part of his kingdom. From cover to cover in the Bible, we see that God is king. If you go back to the Old Testament, you'll see every other nation, every other nation had a king that led them. Not the Israelites. They didn't have a king. God was their king. God was their leader. But then the Israelites come along and they go, but we want to be like everybody else. We want to fit in. We want, oh, they're different than us. So they said, God, would you give us a king? And he's like, you're not going to like it. I'll do what you're asking, but you're not going to like it because I'm going to give you a man to rule over you and man aren't perfect. And so God establishes kings over the Israelites. And the first king is King Saul and he got jacked up. And then King David comes in. He was pretty good. Solomon and so on and so forth. And all of these kings, if you read throughout the Old Testament, some of them got it right, a lot of them got it wrong. And we'll circle back on that in just a minute. But then you fast forward and you get to the New Testament and you get to the Gospels, the life of Jesus. And God looks down and he goes, I put some men in charge. They didn't get it right. I need to bring a new king and establish, come on somebody, a different kingdom. 
Woo, come on, this is going to get good. And the angel of the Lord shows up to Mary and he says, hey, you're going to have a baby. You're going to conceive and give birth to a son and he ain't going to be like everybody else. And you are to call him, say it with me. Jesus. Let's go. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. And this is what it says about his kingdom. His kingdom, come on, will have no end. Every other king that has ever ruled and reigned here on this earth, their kingdom has came, came to an end. Alexander the Great, great king, led his people for a long time, conquered a lot of the world. Kingdom came to an end. Every king, their kingdom will end. Jesus, his kingdom will go on forever and ever. I don't know about you, but that's a kingdom I want to be a part of. Fast forward all the way to the end of your Bible, to the book of Revelation, and over and over, John is establishing that Jesus is king. And I love this verse, Revelation 19, 16, on his robe, so Jesus is rocking a robe, and on his thigh, he has this name written, which means what? Jesus is tatted up. Well, you're not supposed to get a tattoo because it's the body, it's the Jew, you do, you do. On his thigh. Well, maybe it was Sharpie. Maybe it was like just, you know, like a, a washable magic erase. On his thigh. Check yourself before you wreck yourself, all right? Is <laughs> written, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's bad to the bone, man. Like, hey, just in case you didn't know, <laughs> king of kings on one thigh, lord of lords on the other thigh. Come on. And if you're like, but it's like, let's go back to the Greek and the Hebrew. What does thigh really mean? Thigh. Okay. <laughs> and let's go back to elementary school for just a little bit. Capital K, lowercase k. Capital L, lowercase l. Meaning, there's been a lot of kings in this world, but there is one king who rules over those kings. There's been a lot of people that have showed up on the scene and called themselves Lord, but there is one Lord who rules and reigns over those lords. And so we're not here this morning to vote. We don't need a special election. Thank you, God, that the Jacksonville elections are over. I don't need to see any more signs. I don't need any more commercials. But the presidential one is right around the corner. And here's my guy, and this is my person, and vote for them, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. We're not having a special election. Hey, we're going to pass out some ballots, and if you think Jesus is king, would you just check the box? He's king whether you believe he's king or not. And the question is, is he your king? Like, legit, he's king. Is he your king? And if you're here this morning in person watching online and you're like, actually, I don't really want him to be my king. I want to be king. Cool. Go for it. He'll let you do it. But enjoy your pathetic kingdom. Your kingdom is so sorry. Your kingdom is so weak. Nobody's going to follow you. Your kingdom's going to come to an end. Your kingdom stinks. I'm just being honest with you because I love you. I need to tell you that. His kingdom has no end. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And to call him king in your life, like, like to truly say that he's king, this is what I wrote down, to truly say yes to Jesus as kings means we get off the throne of our lives and we let him sit on the throne. Because a king, when he sits on the throne, he makes the laws. And what he says is rule. A king calls the shots. So you can either say, God, you're king in my life. You rule, you reign, you call the shots. Or you can say, nah, I'm good, I'm king. I'm gonna do what I want. I'm calling the shots, go for it. But if he's the king of your life, he rules, he reigns. 
We submit to him. We surrender to him. If you go back and you read in the Old Testament, really starting in the book of 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, and then even into Chronicles, you read about the Old Testament kings that came in. And I was doing some research and I came across this article and I don't know when it starts in the Bible and when it ends, but it was saying in a 200 year period of Israel kings that there were 33 of them. Do you know how many of them were God-fearing men that led and submitted their lives to God and how many weren't? Five followed God, 28 didn't. 200 years, five kings submitted to God, 28 said, no, I'm gonna do whatever I want. And this is how the Bible would record it. This king died and this king took over. And it would either say, and this king followed after God and was obedient, or it would say this about those 28. They did what was evil in the sight of God. Meaning, they did whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, with no regard to God. And they would know, they would have known that God had done all this for the people, but they would step in as king and go, nope, we're doing what I want. And I think just maybe in the world we live in today, we got a lot of people doing that, but even in the church today, we can, we can do that as well. And if we're not careful, we will take Jesus off the throne and we'll put ourselves back on it. And we'll call the shots and we won't live surrendered. In the New Testament, Paul is writing to a church and he says these words. Hey, we pleaded with you. Like we didn't just plead with you, we also encouraged you. We didn't just plead and encourage you, we urged you. What, Paul, what are you urging? What are you pleading? What do you encourage? To live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. Like when God looks down at us, he looks on and goes, oh, they're living a life that is worthy. And then he reminds us, for he called you to share in his kingdom and his glory. Can I, can I pastor you for just a moment? Because I love you. I wanna plead with you. I wanna encourage you. And I want to urge you, you have one life. Would you live it in a way that is worthy? Would you live it for his kingdom? Would you live it in a way that honors him? Come on, you're a part of the kingdom of God. He alone is king. Surrender your life and live it for him. Let me take you on a quick journey, a very quick journey. You ready? Before Jesus you were a part of the kingdom of darkness. What does that mean? Before Jesus, and maybe you're there right now, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. This is where you are right now. You're in sin, you're stuck, you can't get out, your life's probably a mess. Now here's what I love about our church. We have so many people that have come in and their faith is brand new. I mean, literally, they just started following Jesus. So for them, they remember the mess that their lives were in. For many others of you, you've been following Jesus for a while. Maybe you've forgotten what your life was like. I'm not telling you to live there, but it's good to revisit there every once in a while and go, oh my gosh, God, thank you for what you saved me from. Because in the kingdom of darkness, we are stuck in our sin. It is master over us. We're a slave to it. And here's the really bad news. We can't get out on our own. Here's the really good news. Jesus came to rescue us. Because I couldn't get out on my own, all I have to do is call on him and say, Jesus, would you come and save me from this mess that I've made? Would you pull me out of this darkness? And he goes, that's, that's what I do best. And he comes and he rescues us. And now that I have Jesus, come on somebody, now I'm in, the, I'm in the kingdom of light. To which Jesus would say, you don't have to walk in darkness anymore, now you can walk in my light. You don't have to trip all over yourself because you didn't know what you were doing, now you see the path that I'm calling you to. And then Paul writes to the church in Rome, he says these words, hey, for the kingdom of God, it's, it's not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. What's he saying here? Hey, the kingdom of God, it's not about just having a good time. It's not about just, woo, I can't wait for the weekend, baby. It's not about just living it up here on this earth. That's why, like, 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against like elections. Like we got a city councilman that attends our church, like our city councilman in this area. Like he comes to our church. Like I'm not against elections and politicians and all the things. I am against people that live for this kingdom and think I need to get my politician in because if I get my guy, my girl in, then everything's gonna get better. Maybe. Or, or, or maybe if we get more of Jesus <laughs> to change people's hearts, we might start seeing a difference here. And so can I just be honest with you from like now until like the presidential election next year, like for the next year and a half, you're just going to hear me proclaim this is not our home. So, so, so yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. So praise God for good laws that, that help us and praise God for, for good politicians that lead with integrity and maybe not, I don't know, whatever character, you know what I'm saying? Like (laughs) praise God. But what we need is the kingdom of God to come to earth. And if we're only caught up in this world, what happens when your politician doesn't win? Oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. Praise God, that means Jesus is coming back. (laughs) Maybe we need to start voting for the opposite person. That way God will come back a little quicker. I don't know. The kingdom of God, it's not about the things of this world. It's something greater. It's about righteousness. What does that mean? about righteous living. Before Jesus, we were in sin. We were making a mess of our lives. He rescued us from that. Come on, anybody remember that you were in a kingdom of darkness? Anybody grateful that you've been rescued? Five of you, thank you, that's awesome. That just reminds me that all of you don't know Jesus. That's okay, that's what we're here for. I'm just teasing, I love you. There was no righteousness in my life before Jesus. Now, because of him, he has given me his righteousness. Now, righteousness should come out right living. I, I, I'm not going back to the junk. I want, I want to live righteously. And I can only do that through the power of God. And I can only do that by seeking God and letting him fill me up. So if you ever look on your life and you go, righteousness isn't coming out of me, it's probably because you're not seeking the one who is righteous. If you're lacking peace right now, it's probably because you're not seeking the prince of peace. He doesn't just give peace. He is peace. This is why our world's a wreck right now. It's not because we need a poly. It's because nobody's at peace. We need Jesus. We need King Jesus to come into people's hearts and lives. And, and joy. Man, our world is hopeless. People are miserable. And we have the joy of the Lord on the inside of us. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is actually our strength, like God's joy in our hearts. And joy is contagious, man. You better get some joy up in your life. I got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? It's in my heart. Therefore, it should show on my face. It should come out of my life. Some of y'all be walking into church. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Like, no, (laughs) come on. I'm not saying life's easy. Some of you are walking through hell on earth right now. It's hard to find joy. You gotta fight for it. You gotta keep seeking him though. And he'll give you joy in the midst of your sorrow. It is supernatural. And that's what the kingdom of God is. It's not seeking everything else on this world because it'll all leave you empty. It's going, God, I want more righteousness. I want more of your peace. And I want more of your joy in my life. And we've been invited into this kingdom. Therefore, our lives should start to look different. Let's have a little fun. You with me right here? Because none of y'all know Jesus, so we need to have some fun right now. Okay, here we go. How many of you know that different occasions call for different attire? Different different places you go call for you to dress differently. All right, confession time, 10 o'clock. This is gonna be good. Come on, be honest or God will get you. How many of you, knowing that you're gonna go get some takeout food and you're gonna go through the drive-thru, you don't even have to get out of your car, How many of you have ever jumped in your car without any shoes on? Come on, awesome. How many of you have ever jumped in your car without any pants on? No, don't answer that, don't answer that, don't answer that. You know, I don't have to get out of my car. They're not gonna see what I'm wearing. I don't need to put any shoes on. I'm just going through the drive-thru. That's allowed, because you're not getting out of your car. Now, I don't need you to confess this about yourselves, but how many of you have seen somebody wearing something that they should not be wearing when you've gone to Walmart? (laughs) And I get it. The bar's pretty low, all right? Like, 
it's Walmart. But come on, people. Like, I'm even okay with pajama pants because, like, they're pants. Like, they're literally covering. I'm talking about, like, what are you wearing right now? And you, you, did you look in a mirror? Do you own a mirror? Because you walked out of the house like that. And you look on and you just go, come on, people. We can do better than that. Maybe you're going out with friends and you're going to just a casual restaurant. So, you know, T-shirt, jeans, and tennis shoes is fine. Maybe you even put on something with buttons. But if you're going to a wedding, T-shirts are not appropriate unless the bride and groom tell you to wear a T-shirt. You need to put on some buttons. You need to put on a belt, maybe even tuck it in every once in a while. How many of you have ever seen people that show up to the Kentucky Derby? That's a whole nother dress code, isn't it? The hats must be this big. Like if you ain't hitting somebody with your hat, you ain't doing it right. It's weird. Did anybody watch the coronation of King Charles? Anybody watch that? Just me riveting television on the edge of my seat. What's going to happen? He's going to become king. That's what's happening. I watched it for a couple minutes. I just wanted to kind of see like tradition, like Elizabeth's been, you know, like queen the whole time. So like, let somebody else have a turn. You know what I mean? Like, and so, so, you know, he's getting crowned king. They put the crown on him. He's carrying the scepters. I like seeing just what people were dressed in. Can you imagine if they put the crown on his head and he's holding the deals and he's robe, and all the things, if he stands up after being crowned king and he goes, all right, let's go rob a bank. That'd be ridiculous, right? Like, you're the king. You can't, you can't act like that. Right. The moment that you surrender your life to Jesus and you call on him as savior, you also call on him as Lord and king of your life. Therefore, now your life is submitted under his kingship and it should look different. The rest of the world can do whatever they want. I laugh all the time when people are like, just look at them. Look what they're doing. They're just sinning. Exactly. That's what they're supposed to do. They're not following Jesus. Like, that's what I did before I started. I was really good at sinning. But now that I'm a part of a different kingdom, my life should look different. So he's the king. He's inviting us into his kingdom Therefore, now we're royalty. And I want to share with you something that I believe with all of my heart. You're kings and queens now. He is still the king, but you are royalty now. You're in his kingdom. You have royal blood flowing through your veins now. And if you're like, well, I don't feel comfortable being called a king or a queen, then you can be a prince and a princess. But you're a king and a queen. Therefore, your life should represent that. Your life should look different. So women, let me talk to you for just a little bit. This is a message I've been wanting to preach for a while. I got something to say to you ladies. Proverbs 31 talks about what a righteous woman looks like, what a woman who follows after God looks like. And I don't have time to unpack all the verses, but here's a couple of them that I wrote down. Proverbs 31, 25. It says she is clothed with strength and dignity. Let me stop right there. She's clothed with strength, not her strength, God's strength. And she's, she's a dignified woman. She's not just out there acting a fool, running her mouth. We'll get more into that in just a minute. She's clothed with strength and dignity. Like she, these are the clothes that she wears. And I love this. She laughs without fear of the future. Why? because she's putting her trust in God. Her hope is in the king. Come on, women. You know you can trust your father. He loves you. He cares about you. I love this. The next verses. When she speaks, come on, somebody, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. When she speaks, when she opens up her mouth. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about any of you women in here today, but there are women in the world. You know them. They're in your family, probably your husband's side. You know what I'm saying? Probably your mother-in-law. Probably in your workplace. That when they speak, it ain't wise. It's foolishness, man. It's opinions. It's, they don't think before they speak. They just let it rip, right? And it's not just in person. It's online. 
Social media, just put my opinion out there, just letting y'all know what I think. I don't want to know what you think. They're not, they're, not, they're not wise. What does a godly woman do? She thinks before she speaks. And the words that she speaks, they're full of wisdom. And then it says this, that she, she gives instruction with kindness. Like if she does have to lead somebody, if she does have to correct somebody, if she does have to talk to her husband about something or tell her kids something, she's gonna do it with kindness. Nobody likes a bossy woman. Bossiness is not godliness. You tracking with me? The the wisest guy in the Bible, Solomon, wrote Proverbs. He said this, it's better to sit on the corner of the roof of your house than live with a nagging woman. We're gonna see some men up here sitting up on their roofs today. (laughs) Just what the... It's what he said, babe. It's what he said. (laughs) We might see some women sitting up there too. We can reverse the roles, baby. You're gonna bring some correction and some instruction? Don't, Don't be bossy. Be kind. Kindness is the fruit of the Spirit. When kindness is coming out of you, that's Jesus. When bossy, ugly, rude, demanding comes out, that's you. We don't want that. That helps no one. Can I get a better amen? amen. Come on, let's read on about this. Let's, that, was, that was good, come on. There are many virtuous, and, 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 and this next wordage right here, this is actually said about this woman from her husband and her kids. They say this about her. Hey, there are many virtuous and capable women in the world. Who, girl, you surpass them all. Like, may the people closest to us say this about us. You ready? Because how many of you know that there are sometimes we act one way in front of some people, but then behind closed doors with the people closest to us, we act a different way. I never want my kids to walk up to one of you and go, my dad ain't like this with us. I don't want my wife to ever say, yeah, you should see him. I wanna be the same person in my house, on the stage, everywhere I go. I don't want my staff to be like, oh, y'all should see you, Pastor. No, no, no. I want them to be like, he surpasses them all. Come on, women. You don't have to be like everybody else. Come on, let's some godliness. You're a queen. You're in the kingdom of God. Let's go. I love this next verse. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last. Turn to her and tell her, you're gonna get ugly. <laughs> don't do that, don't do that. That, was, that would have not been wise. But it, but it won't last. But a woman who fears the Lord, she'll be greatly praised. A woman who fears the Lord, like people will look on and go, I'll follow that girl. I'll follow, she's a leader. She trusts in God. She's not living for the things of this world. She's following after him. Now, men, let me get to you. Because Proverbs 31, so many of the verses talk about what a godly woman is. But there is a part at the beginning of Proverbs 31 that I would bet, even if you grew up in church, you've never read. And I wanna land there today because there's a mama that has some words that she wants to speak to her son. And her son's name is Lemuel. If we got any pregnant women in the house with a baby boy, Lemuel, I'm just throwing it out there to you. And she says this to her son, Lemuel. He says, oh, she says, oh, my son, oh, son of my womb, oh, son of my vows, do not waste your strength on women, on those who ruin kings. What is she saying there? Get away from all women? No, she's saying get away from the wrong women. Get away from that woman. She is not good for you. She is poison. Stay away from her. And I'm not just talking physically, I'm talking virtually as well. Stop looking, stop clicking, stop liking, stop swiping. Why? Because it ruins kings. Stop wasting your strength on what you're looking at on the internet. Stop wasting your strength, single man, on pursuing the wrong girl on this earth because it will ruin you. It will... It is ruining some of you right now. God's had so much more. You know he does. 
You know he does. Don't let it ruin you. And in these next couple verses, I'm just gonna let the Lord speak. This is the Bible, this ain't me. This is a mama talking to her son. It is not for kings to drink wine. It is not for rulers to crave beer. For when they drink, that alcohol is gonna take over. They're gonna forget what is right and they aren't able to help those in need. Lemuel's a king. And she's like, you got a kingdom to lead. If you're over here getting wasted, you can't help anybody. Now I know what you're thinking. All right, pastor, you telling me I can't drink? No, I'm not. The Bible does not say that you can't drink. Jesus turned water into wine, okay? But what does the Bible clearly tell us? Do not get drunk. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been drunk before. I've never been drunk before. My wife sometimes looks on and goes, I just wonder what you would look like drunk. Like, what would it look like? Like, you, you, you're this extrovert. What would it? I was like, I don't wanna know. I don't wanna know. Never been drunk. But some of you have. And you know, like, when you're drunk, you're not in control of yourself. The alcohol is. That's why Paul said, like, don't get drunk. Get filled with the Holy Spirit because then the Holy Spirit has control of your life. And so these verses I came across about eight years ago, my pastor was preaching them to a group of pastors, to a group of men. And he said, men, I wanna challenge you. God's called you to be kings. But some of you are letting some things ruin your kingdom. Some of you are letting some things come into your life, whether it's women or alcohol, you're letting it ruin you. And see, so he said, I wanna challenge you. And for me, this was challenging because I've never been drunk, but I enjoyed a drink every once in a while. Never even been close to drunk, but every once in a while, just, I just enjoy it in the comfort of my own home. And when he was preaching these verses, I'm telling you, I'm fighting it with everything. No, nah, that's not for me. No, 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 I don't need, I don't have a problem with drinking. And he said this, I just want you to ask God if this is something that he wants you to surrender. I said, all right, God, do you want me to surrender this? And I felt like with everything in my heart, the Lord just pointed me right back to Proverbs 31. And he said, do you wanna be a king? Do you wanna lead your house as a king? Do you wanna lead your church as a king? Do you wanna be influential in my kingdom as a king? Do you want to? Then why wouldn't you give it over to me, Adam? What would be the benefit of holding on to it? So for every one thing that you might say, yeah, alcohol is not bad. Here's one thing that blah, 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 blah. I'll give you two reasons why it is. And for me personally in my life, I had to identify, if I don't even welcome it into my home, guess what? It can never ruin me. If I don't ever touch it, it can't ruin me. But if I keep it, in my life, I could let it, I could have a long day here. I could have a bad Sunday where nobody amen me. And I just want to go home and have a drink, man. And then that one drink turns into two and the two turns into, because you've been there before. But if I don't even let it into my life, I'm good. And now it's not going to affect me. And now I'm not going to forget. And now I'm going to see the needs of others around me and be able to help them in their time of need. And I'm just telling you, that's a me thing. But maybe, just maybe, the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe, just maybe, there is something today that God wants to reveal in your life and just kind of really say to you in these words, I want you to surrender to me fully. I want you to give it to me fully. And I just want to give you that opportunity. We're not going to close with a song today. We're just gonna sit in this moment and I just want the Lord to speak to your heart. So every head bowed, every eye closed. And here's what I want you to ask of God right now in this moment. Hey God, what's the one thing in my life right now that you want me to surrender completely to you? God, what's the one thing in my life right now that you have been speaking to me on 
and I've been making excuses or I've been justifying it. God, what's the one thing in my life right now that if I surrendered it to you, it actually could keep me from ruining my life. And the beautiful thing about God is he's a personal God, so he'll speak to you on something and he'll speak to somebody else on something completely different and it's because that's not for you. Just so I know that you're with me this morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Would anybody be honest in here and just go, I know exactly what the one thing is that God is speaking to my heart on right now. Would you just lift your hand in the air if you know what it is? Come on, so good, thank you for that. Hey, for some of you, I know this has been for me in my life. For some of you, it's a TV show. I've had a moment in my life where the Lord is like, I don't want you to watch that show anymore. It's not healthy for you. Maybe it's music that you're listening to. Maybe it is a substance. Maybe it's a certain website. Maybe it's social media altogether. I don't know what it is, but God will speak to you directly. Come on, just listen to his voice today. And I promise you this, if you'll surrender that thing, you'll be able to pick up more of him. God would never ask you to give something up if he didn't have something better for you. With nobody looking around also, I wanna invite somebody to be a part of his kingdom today for the very first time. You've been doing your own thing. You've never fully surrendered your life to Jesus. But today could be the greatest day of your life to say, I'm ready to get off the throne. I'm ready for Jesus to get on the throne and for him to rule and reign my life. I'm ready for him to be my savior and my Lord to forgive me of my sins. I'm ready to follow him. With nobody looking around, I'm gonna count to three in just a moment. If that's you in the house, come on, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. If that's you online, you can click the link that we give you. But come on, anybody wanna get bold today and just go, I'm giving my life to Jesus. One, two, three, just shoot your hand in the air right now. Come on, praise God. 